Welcome to day two of our um, workshop slash conference on the ethics of ordeals. Uh, thank you for being here uh, this morning. I'm Mira Levinson and I am moderating uh, our panel uh, with Christopher Robertson, Dan Hausman, and Anka Gayush. Um, uh, we're going to hear from each of them, uh, starting with uh, Christopher, uh, then Dan, then Anka. Then we'll have a conversation, we'll open it up to you all, and I'm just going to remind everybody, including our speakers, to speak into the microphone since we're videotaping it. And I'm not going to spend time introducing our speakers since you have information about them. So, let's go ahead and kick it off. Thank you, and good morning. Um, this is uh, exciting to be here. Uh, I've been involved with uh, Nir and Paul for, I think, the better part of four years thinking about these issues, and it's great to see them uh, come to a culmination here. Um, um, Nir asked me to start by refreshing everyone's memory who was here yesterday and, and uh, setting uh, a conceptual frame for, for the people that weren't here yesterday by maybe even defining the term what we're talking about. We're using in this group um, the term uh, ordeal uh, to be somewhat synonymous with rationing through inconvenience, that phrase, or rationing through hassle, uh, which uh, altogether refers to a non-financial burden uh, that causes individuals to choose uh, to uh, consume or not consume health care in a way that the system sort of prefers. Uh, so often that'll mean choosing a less expensive health care rather than an expensive one, or, uh, uh, or uh, undertaking a public health uh, measure such as chlorinating your water that the health uh, system designer prefers, presumably f because it's good for, for welfare or, or efficiency. Um, so a couple examples that we talked about yesterday, for example, uh, was um, uh, in distributing chlorine tablets uh, in the uh, 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 in resource deprived environments, uh, rather than just giving out the tablets directly to individuals, uh, it was found to be more efficient to instead give them a voucher that the individuals could then go redeem at a dispensary at some bit of hassle to actually go to the dispensary and get it. And the thought was that those people that undertake the effort are then both revealing uh, through their behavior that they are the type of person that's likely to use it and perhaps also in a way pre-committing to use it by sinking the cost of their effort, it might actually change their type into the more compliant type. Either way, it might uh, increase uh, the sort of public health benefit per tablet distributed and thus maybe allow more tablets to be distributed to other villages or maybe allow uh, other uh, welfare enhancing uses of those resources instead. Uh, so in the U.S. healthcare system, uh, an example of rationing through inconvenience that I offered yesterday was simply the requirement to go to a physician uh, for a prescription drug, um, such as, for example, the requirement to go to a physician if you want a birth control pill. Now, we might talk about whether that's uh, a good uh, use of rationing through inconvenience or whether we might be better off making that particular intervention available over the counter with less hassle or even directly mailed to people uh, with even less hassle than that. So that's this concept of rationing through inconvenience. And just to remind it, it, it really focuses on these non-financial burdens, and it's mediated through the consumer's own choices. Um, so uh, for my contribution in this uh, distributive ethics panel, I'll just offer three uh, theses or three categories of observations. And the first is I want to suggest we do have a prima facie obligation um, to reduce consumption uh, in a lot of these domains. Uh, a lot of what we talked about so far has been about targeting uh, efficiency or allocative efficiency, getting drugs to the right people, uh, uh, as opposed to uh, getting them to people that they're not going to be very good for. I'll talk more about that in a moment. But um, even if that didn't work, uh, it would often be the case that we could enhance welfare by randomly choosing uh, health care interventions and denying them to people, um, and instead using that money, say, for direct uh, wealth transfers to the poor. Uh, the evidence we have about healthcare spending in the United States, at least, and that's where I'm focusing for the moment, is that you know the dollars we spend there are probably not their highest and best use that we could be providing. Even if all we cared about was health, we could probably promote more health through education or through housing or through um, food. And so I think there is a prima facie uh, policy <coughs> imperative to reduce consumption. 
uh, to the extent uh, that we can. Now, we, we could start carving out exceptions to that. Of course, we don't want to reduce consumption of a few highly uh, efficient things, but that's generally um, not what the bulk of health care spending in the United States is on. So that's intentionally provocative. But the second point is um, that um, this idea of allocative efficiency really depends on some premises that I want to make explicit. And the first is that there is, in fact, a heterogeneity of efficacy. That is, that some people really will benefit more than others from a given intervention. And that can then be split out into two parts. There might be, A, what I'd call subjective heterogeneity, that some people just have different values and preferences, so they'll get more out of it. It may be possible in the chlorine example that some people are really sensitive to the flavor of chlorine and thus would have a huge disutility from using the tablets. Or maybe it's possible that some people have some sort of natural resistance to the parasites and thus would get very little upside benefits from the chlorine. Uh, and so they might just not like it very much in that um, uh, subjective way. This might seem implausible. Uh, but B is, is the second factor is a more objective, um, aside from your values and preferences, some people will just benefit from the drug that other people won't. In the age of pre precision medicine, for example, we'll increasingly be able to know whether you should take chemotherapy A or chemotherapy B because genetically and physiologically chemotherapy B is actually better for you. And so maybe in theory we could use some form of rationing to inconvenience to help target in that way. So that's A and B. Um, uh, subjective and objective heterogeneity. But I want to make more explicit, though, that this whole theory depends on the consumer being able to choose for herself uh, accurately. And you might think that's relatively obvious with regard to, A, the subjective utility. A consumer knows herself, presumably. But keep in mind, we're talking about a future-oriented choice. The consumer needs to be able to predict in advance how she will experience that health care intervention, whether she's the type of person, uh, how she'll feel about the side effects versus the benefits trade-off, the extension of life versus the increase in suffering, or et cetera. And those predictions are very hard to make. And we actually know that um, individuals uh, over-predict, for example, their disutility associated with uh, uh, disability, for example. People have very difficulty to even knowing their future preferences and values. So that's, even A is more tricky than we might assume. But I want to suggest B is especially tricky. Like the example I gave a moment ago about knowing whether you're the type of person that needs cancer drug A or cancer drug B is really difficult physiologically. So the notion that rationing through inconvenience or through other sort of consumer choice would allow that efficiency. If we really get into the weeds, it might involve some heroic assumptions. So when we look at cases like the chlorine, um, you know, in the, in the case study we saw yesterday, um, we thought it was a relative success because rationing through inconvenience had the same uptake rate of about 32% as just giving out the drug or the chlorine to everyone. But it's worth thinking about that leaves two thirds of the population who have access to free chlorine not using it, right? From a public health perspective, if the counterfactual is nobody using it, getting up to 32% is great. But if the counterfactual, what we really want is 100% of people getting chlorinated water, wow, what's happening? Who are these people that are getting free chlorine and declining to actually consume it? And if we delved a little closer into those cases, I think we would finally uh, find some sort of disturbing gradients. Um, these are people that, um, for example, perhaps don't know or don't understand the value of, of chlorine or radically discount the risk in, a, in, a, in an irrational way of their children suffering di uh, diarrhea and dying, or other sorts of uh, uh, failures, um, really, uh, to take care of themselves or their families. And so what it turns out, then, is that we're actually rationing on not choice, but we're rationing on what I would call luck and wherewithal. Um, for example, we might assume that um, some people are going to live closer to the dispensaries than other people out of sheer luck. And so it may turn out, presumably, that those that live closer suffer less inconvenience and thus are more likely to consume. And so we see this luck gradient uh, interfering uh, with our goals for targeting efficiency. But also wherewithal, things like having enough time to walk to the dispensary or having um, a physician that's willing to spend time on the phone advocating on your behalf to get you that off-label drug uh, prescription. These sorts of things we might call wherewithal in a, in a broad category. And I'll just flag there, that'll often go along with, with mental health, um, uh, which uh, uh, things like depression, for example, make it very hard to motivate yourself um, to take uh, advocacy on your own behalf. And it will also correlate with things like education and income. <laughs>
Okay, so rationing through inconvenience often turns into rationing through wherewithal and luck. Um, but as I said, that even if, uh, that, that maybe even just randomly reducing consumption in the U.S. system could actually improve welfare overall and serve larger goals of distributive ethics. So you actually have to think about what's the alternative to rationing through inconvenience in these cases. Often it will be cost sharing. Often it will be cost exposure. And I do want to <coughs> argue that one of the advantages of rationing through cost exposure or uh, financial participation, we sometimes called it yesterday, uh, or you know, de deductibles, co-pays, co-insurance, user fees, lots of different words for the same concept. One advantage of using that approach is that it can be scaled relatively easily. To the extent that ability to pay or proxies for ability to pay are observable, to the extent that we have tax forms and we have qualifications for Medicaid or children's free lunch programs, to the extent that we can observe roughly your ability to pay, we can scale cost exposure. We don't do a very good job of that in the US. We do put people in buckets like, OK, you're in Medicaid, so there's very little cost exposure. OK, you're in private insurance, so there's more cost exposure. You'll recall one of the efforts of Obamacare was to create a convoluted tax credit scheme in the individual markets to reimburse people for their cost exposures. Um, uh, uh, so, so there are some efforts in that way. But I think um, that uh, it should be a primary goal of health insurance design. Uh, is to do that scaling. And I, at least in principle, it's much easier to do with money than it is with inconvenience. It's really hard to give you like a half helpful doctor or a two-thirds helpful doctor to scale for the amount of, of busyness your other doctor is. Um, you know, it's hard to put everyone equidistant from the clinic, um, but we can at least um, put everyone uh, <coughs> having cost exposure that's relatively uh, reasonable given their ability to pay. And in the US, I just want to last point related to this is I think we focus a lot on the poor uh, and why we should have them paying less out of pocket and getting greater access to care. I also think we should have the rich paying more out of pocket, in fact. Uh, I think we actually have an implicit health essentialism built into our insurance schemes that insulate even wealthy people from health risks in a way I think uh, is regressive. And so we should be scaling uh, both upwards and downwards. Thank you. How do I get my slides? Probably on that computer. Okay, uh, great. Uh, well, uh, when uh, Nir uh, and uh, Anders in invited me, they asked me to talk about sort of the distributive implications of um, ordeals, which seemed to me a really huge subject, so I decided to narrow it, to narrow it down and to talk, talk about ordeals specifically with relationship to the problem of moral hazard, which is uh, a, a pervasive one with any sort of uh, insurance, including health insurance. So moral hazard is basic, uh, presumably everybody or almost everybody knows what it is, but it's the idea that people make fewer efforts to avoid an outcome against which they're insured. And you can draw a distinction with respect to health insurance between ex ante moral hazard, and that is that those who are insured make fewer efforts to stay healthy, or ex post, those who already have a health problem won't economize on their treatment. It's ex post that I'm going to be uh, focusing on. Uh, I should say that moral hazard, although it increases costs, is not always a bad thing. Sometimes people are uh, disinclined to seek health care that's very uh, useful for them, and the fact that we've made it uh, cheaper and easier to do uh, may be a very good thing. Uh, however, 
the responses that we make to moral hazard, to mitigate the problems of moral hazard, uh, inevitably uh, create inequalities. And it's those that I want to talk about. So I'm going to use a very schematic example, simplified example. I'm going to suppose that there's two treatments for some condition, some serious condition. A platinum treatment, which is expensive, comfortable, not very inconvenient to uh, go through the treatment. And a bronze treatment, which is cheap and uncomfortable. And I'm going to suppose that these two treatments are equal, equally curative. However, the bronze treatment is dangerous for patients with various risk factors. Different patients, it's not as if there's some simple test to tell whether um, the bronze treatment would be dangerous for a particular patient or not. And the moral hazard problem in this case is that if insurance covers both treatments, who in the world is going to use the bronze treatment? The uh, platinum treatment is uh, uh, on average safer and much more comfortable and convenient. So what do we do about that? Well, there's a variety of techniques that health insurance systems use to limit the moral hazard problem. There's deductibles. Uh, and in this case, they're only going to help if they're larger than the cost of the bronze treatment. Otherwise, you're in the same boat with either one. There's co-pays. But the problem is that if you make co-pays really low, they don't have much effect. And if you make them high, then, of course, there's a distributional effect. Those people who are relatively poor will be discouraged from uh, getting treatment. And indeed, one of the things that has been quite striking with respect to Obamacare is that a lot of the policies have very, very high deductibles. And as a result, uh, lots of people uh, postpone or avoid getting treatment at all. And uh, we're defeating at least some of the purposes of the insurance. There's treatment protocols. Um, how effective these are vary. Obviously, the physician who wants the best for his patient or her patient is going to be favoring the platinum treatment over the bronze treatment. And then, of course, uh, the most effective way, although it's very ham-fisted, very blunt, is for the insurance company to say, look, we simply aren't going to pay for the uh, platinum treatment. We'll pay for the bronze. We'll reimburse you for the cost of the bronze treatment, not the platinum. And, that, and then, of course, only people who can pay out of pocket um, get the platinum treatment. OK, so how might ordeals help? Uh, I'm treating ordeals as non-monetary costs, which, unlike nudges, may be very substantial. Uh, and you know, there are things like times, convenient risks, discomfort, and so forth. Uh, they can be imposed on different uh, parties. Uh, providers, patients, even insurance companies could be subjected to uh, ordeals. And different ordeals are bound to have different consequences for uh, inequalities. And some ordeals, ordeals that come with stigma, for example, are bound to provoke inequalities. But of course, they could <coughs> counteract other inequalities within the society. So they might make inequalities worse. They might limit inequalities. So what do we want ordeals to do? Well, we want our deals in this schematic, very simplified case. We want them to limit how many people get the platinum treatment. It's too expensive if, for everyone to get it. We want to make it the case that those who get the platinum treatment are more likely to need it, as opposed to those who simply want the greater comfort. We'd like to attenuate the connection between wealth and the comfort and uh, safety of the treatment people get. And we'd like to mitigate, or at least not aggravate, overall inequalities in our society. So what can we do? Well, we can make the platinum treatment relatively less pleasant or, or convenient. And of course, we can do that by making it more inconvenient, or by making the bronze treatment less inconvenient. And of course, if we could do that, that would be a nicer thing to do than to make everybody, uh, make everybody uh, more miserable. And then, of course, we could also impose ordeals on uh, physicians. So this is sort of the, the bottom line. Uh, the way I'd put it is maybe we can use more, uh, ordeals to make money talk more quietly. Inevitably, as I see it, people who are uh, affluent, well-connected, are going to wind up getting better health care, more pleasant health care, uh, I can't envision being able to avoid that altogether. 
but we could perhaps mitigate that if we have a society where there are large income and wealth inequalities, as there obviously are in the US, those are going to tend to translate into inequalities in terms of the health care people get. Ordeals can limit this carryover. Now, I don't want to romanticize this, but we can think of ordeals as equalizers. They put people together from different walks of life. They all have to sit together in the same waiting room. Uh, and it's a site in which there can be a certain kind of solidarity, in which there is not inequalities among people. Now, I mean, it's not like uh, if you go to the DMV and everybody's there getting their licenses, gee, it's this great occasion where everybody <laughs> hugs one another. In fact, we've actually managed technology whereby you don't even need to make eye contact with people. You can just pull out your uh, uh, smartphone and talk on the phone to people who are in your own class and the like. But nevertheless, it at least is, if nothing else, symbolically, a circumstance in which we treat people uh, as uh, equals and which money, although it's going to have an effect, will have uh, less, an, uh, less of an, uh, an effect. And so I think that there's something to be said for thinking specifically about how we can use ordeals to address uh, uh, moral hazard problems and to limit the extent to which we rely on uh, financial uh, differences to do that. Now, I, I take uh, Chris's point quite seriously, the notion that we can do uh, scaling, and that certainly would also help with the distributive issues. But I think the, these are complementary rather than opposed to one another. Thank you. Yeah, so um, a couple of caveats before I start. How do I The first one is that I'm, um, I'm not mostly working on medical ethics. I'm working on distributive justice and in particular on gender justice. So um, I'm going to, to give you some considerations that I think can bear on the evaluation of particular ordeals from the point of view of how they are likely to impact on gender justice. That's a complicated kind of discussion, but I will simply uh, talk about gender equality as a proxy for gender justice. The other caveat is that after having read about ordeals and, and after learning uh, lots of things from yesterday's and this morning's discussion, my understanding is that the most reasonable thing to, to say is that we are um, we, we want to evaluate our deals on a one-by-one -one cases. So we obviously need to ration um, healthcare resources, and our deals obviously have some advantages and some disadvantages relative to other ways of rationing healthcare. So everything I'm, I'm going to say is meant, again, to be one, uh, one kind of uh, normative consideration to be used, perhaps, and given different weight in different, um, with respect to different kinds of possible ordeals. So there are, there are two questions to, to which I'm going to say a few, a few words. One is that whether ordeals in the rationing of healthcare can have a pro disproportionate effect on women, and I mean, a, in this case, a disproportionately negative effect on women. And the second one is whether they are and how they are going to influence gender equality. And at least at first glance, I, I suppose, I speculate that the effects can be both positive and negative when it comes to gender equality. So. I can think uh, quite easily of some possible negative outcomes in terms of burdening women more than men, but also in terms of uh, opportunities in setting back, e back equality of opportunity between women and men, at least for some kind of some groups of women. But I can also think about some advantages that rationing by ordeal can have over other kinds of rationing by cost sharing, precisely because ordeals can be designed. And, and uh, when we design our deal, we can do this also with uh, um, paying attention to the effects they can have on gender equality and on women's opportunities um, comparative to, to, to men's. Um, 
So an obvious kind of burden we've been discussing about this yesterday and a bit um, Chris mentioned it this morning um, is that if women are more affected by depression, perhaps also other mental co uh, health conditions, they are likely to be more burdened by, by um, having to deal with certain kinds of ordeals that are difficult if you have a mental health condition. Um, I suppose this can go the other way, uh, the other, the other way as well. I'm, uh, I'm curious to learn from you. There may be health, mental health conditions that affect men such that they would be more burdened as users of, of um, healthcare resources rationed by ordeals than women. But uh, I think that the pre depression is generally um, um, a gendered kind of condition which affects women more than men. Um, another kind of uh, burden that may be disproportionately borne by women and about which I suppose that uh, we'll, we'll hear a lot more about uh, from Julie later on um, is the question of disposable time. So in places, in societies or in subcultures where women are still having less disposable time than men, their time is more, their disposable time is more worthwhile than men's. So Wherever there is a case that women are still carrying a double shift, for instance, having a paid job, but also doing most of the household work and caregiving work, they are going to have less time than men. And then for them, subjectively, the, the cost of deal with, dealing with ordeals is going to be higher than for men. Um, and this is particularly the case if women are going to, in fact, end up on average uh, dealing with ordeals not just for themselves but for their families as well. And this is not an unlikely assumption given that the division of labor is generally gendered and part of the, uh, the, the, the women's role in the division of labor is to take care not just hands-on but also uh, to organize, to manage other people's time, other, the time of other people from their family. Um, then there are other variables, for instance, if some ordeals require that people have enough education to deal with them in those places where women have less education. I suppose this is not usually the case in advanced liberal democracies, but it may be in some subcultures, even in these countries, and worldwide certainly, women may again have a harder time subjectively dealing with ordeals than, than men. And the same may be probably true about ordeals that require people to have quite a high level of self-confidence and assertiveness in, in dealing with authorities. Again, to the extent to which assertiveness is a gender thing, uh, this can be an effect. But I think that the more important, more, well, not the more important, the more interesting way in which gender equality can be impacted by going for ordeals rather than for other kinds of rationing has to do with women's opportunities. So assume that women do in fact take on average more of the work of dealing with ordeals, not just for themselves, but also for their families. Um, this means that they will, this will give women more incentives to ask for more flexibility from work and, um, and also to use all the kinds of entitlements they have as workers for flexible working time and leaves and so on. And if this is going to happen, it will um, eventually also feed the statistical discrimination against women. So. Um, in general, if you are an employer and you have an, two equally qualified uh, uh, potential employees, it is rational for you to employ the one who's going to come closer to the ideal, uh, uh, ideal worker condition, the person who's fully committed to the workplace and who has very few demands on their time outside their work. And that, this, is not a, this is not a particular, in fact, that it has to do in particular with, uh, with ordeals. It's rather something that comes from the, again, from the gender division of labor. If as an employer you expect women, especially women in a particular age, to have more demands on their time from their family, from their caregiving uh, uh, duties in particular, it is rational for you to prefer male employees. And uh, this is one of the, uh, one of the main uh, sources, I think, of, uh, of a lack of equal opportunities between women and men, at least for those kinds of, of jobs in which it makes sense to uh, think there is statistical discrimination, for the kinds of jobs in which you don't want to easily lose your employees or you really need a very high level of commitment from your employees. So it's, it's just part and parcel of a general mechanism that's driven by the gender division of labor. And, um, I think that if cost sharing is the alternative to rationing via ordeals, then maybe we may be actually facing a dilemma between advancing the equal opportunities of women and men in, for some kinds of jobs and giving a priority to the worth of people in general. I'm going to give you a very stylized example of, of uh, what I have in mind. So imagine that Jane and her family are lower class, working class, and Maddie and her family are middle class. If we ration 
healthcare by cost sharing, then Jane is going to, to probably um, face a higher negative impact because she is likely, she and her family are likely to, to uh, suffer more from cost sharing. Of course, it depends on, on the particular way in which the cost sharing is designed than Maddie and her family. On the other hand, if the, if the uh, healthcare is rationed by ordeals, which are based on time investment, well, both Jane and Maddie, assuming that they are going to deal with ordeals for the whole family, are going to be pretty badly affected in terms of their time. But Maddie will also be affected in terms of opportunities because she will be less capable of getting and holding a job that is uh, requiring her undivided attention and time. Um, so again, this may be a small effect compared to other kinds of reasons that, that fit this dynamic and, uh, and the lack of equal opportunities of the, on the market. What I'm trying to say is that if the choice is between these kinds of, of sharing, um, I suppose we have a prioritarian argument for going uh, for, for uh, ordeals, uh, um, rationing by ordeals, simply because we want to protect the worst of first. And, and uh, I suppose there is a discussion to be had here. I don't know what you think in general about the importance of ensuring fair equality of opportunity between women and men for um, very advantageous positions. Uh, but even if you think that's important, you may think that it's even more important to protect the interests of those who are worse off. Uh, finally, perhaps the, the, the particular designs of, um, of um, rationing can uh, bear on this, um, on this di dilemma and mitigate it. So perhaps we can do progressive cost sharing uh, such that Jane is uh, not going to be as uh, negatively affected as Maddie and their families. Perhaps we can have such thing as progressive ordeals in spite of what Chris said earlier. Um, and then a lot, I think, uh, can be said in favor of uh, giving people permissions to buy one themselves out of ordeals or uh, uh, perhaps pay somebody else to, uh, to stand in line for them or uh, uh, pay money instead of completing forms and, and so on. So I suppose that when, when we design ordeals, it makes a lot of sense to go for the worst off, to give priority to the worst off, but at the same time look for creative ways of trying to mitigate the impact, the negative impact on equality of opportunities between women and men, if this is possible. Again, for instance, by allowing people to give money instead of, uh, of time, either by paying third parties or by paying into the system. So finally, I suppose that there can also be positive gender effects to rationing healthcare by, by ordeals rather than financially. Um, if it turns out that it makes sense to use ordeals, that ordeals will be an efficient way of uh, rationing some of the health care that pregnant women get, we can design them such that they are required to participate in the, in the delivery of some health care during pregnancy and childbirth together with their partner. Um, there is quite a bit of research indicating that men's involvement in child rearing is positively correlated with gender equality, and also that men's involvement in child rearing is very much facilitated by early involvement, uh, straight from the, from the child's birth onwards. Um, also, perhaps there are ways of uh, designing ordeals using defaults to demand fathers to accompany ch children to the, to the healthcare provider rather than... Uh, than uh, relying on the status quo, which is, I suppose, again, that women, on average, do this more than, uh, than men. Um, so, in, in general, it's important to keep in mind that inconveniences could be designed to help both with fathers' investment in early childcare and with uh, men's more general involvement in the, the, the gendered, well, in the, in the delivery of caregiving and therefore in the um, undermining of the gendered aspect of the division of labor. And um, yeah, I want to end on this optimistic note about ordeals. Um. <coughs> Terrific. So uh, I'm going to moderate a discussion among us for the next 15 minutes or so, and then invite uh, you all to ask questions uh, as well after that point so you can be thinking of it. I, I'm struck by three things that I heard sort of across the presentations. Let me start with one, uh, which is the relationship between um, epistemic uncertainty and ordeals. 
all three of you, with respect to distributive justice, all three of you in different ways um, raised the idea that ordeals um, are challenging precisely because what we want to do with respect to distributive justice is make things easier or, or in many cases, say, harder for people um, based on features of essentially need and resources with respect to, uh, say, health. Let's just focus on health right now. Uh, health need and or resources. So, you know, we for the platinum versus the bronze care, what we wanted was the people who would actually be endangered by the bronze care to have access to platinum, but we presumptively, we don't really know who those are, because if we did know who those were, then we wouldn't need to impose ordeals in order to organize that. We could just give those people the platinum care. Um, with respect uh, to Chris's uh, presentation, there was the subjective and objective considerations around uh, allocative efficiency. Um, and there, again, there was this uncertainty. Presumably, we were in some sort of epistemic fog, uh, which you know you pointed out that people don't even know their own preferences. It's hard to predict. Uh, we don't actually know even objectively um, necessarily who needs uh, various uh, therapies. And uh, Anka, what you were emphasizing was some uh, measure, I think, of um, uncertainty epistemically, both in terms of how to what extent men and women actually are inconvenienced or um, you know, what effect ordeals do have on uh, men and women and influencing gender equality or inequality. Um, and whether as we impose ordeals versus other kinds of things, uh, people will end up shifting sort of to maintain gender inequality, right, in ways that actually like make things worse for women, or uh, can we structure them in ways that uh, might promote gender e uh, equality? And so I'm curious, you know, when we think about distributive justice, uh, we often are assuming that we have knowledge, and then, at least in ideal circumstances, right? And then we're organizing distributive principles and, and you know, allocation patterns with, with the assumption that we know what will result uh, if we distribute goods in certain ways or opportunities or whatever they are. And then what we debate is, is that the right way to distribute? Right, you know, do we care? Is the the right distributendum, and is this the right? Are these the right principles? But what's interesting about ordeals is that it seems as if they are structured, or they, they are a, a tool of distributive justice, or potentially injustice, that's for times in which we just admit confusion mm -hmm. and epistemic lack of knowledge. I'm curious if you guys have thoughts about that. I'll just say more, I mean, that's also true of, I'll just say that's also true of sort of market approaches. I mean, where we think that, um, you know, there is a heterogeneity of preferences, and so we let people choose to, you know, their own utilities. It's a challenge of central planning. Direct rationing is a form of central planning. So uh, all I'm doing is pointing to the ubiquity of this problem. So in that respect, actually, ordeals are not different, you're saying, from... Or maybe they're motivated by the same sorts of fundamental problems that that we see with political liberalism. That also motivates political liberalism and, and, and so many wide range of other domains. Um, yeah, I don't feel particularly uncertain about the the first things I said in the in my talk. So I suppose it's very likely that if you ration by ordeals, women on average will tend to to deal more with them for at a family level than simply because this is what they usually do when, when there are kind of tasks that can, that, they can, that can be delegated to somebody in the family or uh, need to be managed at the central level of the family, both when it comes to children and maybe other uh, people in need of care, but also when it comes to people who could, in principle, do their own admin. Um, I think what's interesting and special about ordeals is that at first glance you think, oh no, that's going to impact women more than men and it will perhaps set back their opportunities even more. But if you compare it with cost sharing, cost sharing is going to leave the gender division of labor within the family 
as it is. It won't affect it either way. Uh, by contrast, ordeals, if they are designed uh, with an eye to, to the idea of promoting gender equality, because they can use, you can use defaults as or ordeals, and because you can intentionally try to shift the burden from the women to the men or to ask it to be shared, um, is a potential tool for, um, for progress in this respect. Yeah, in that way, what I was hearing you say in part was that um, just as Dan was talking about basically ordeals, at least symbolically and maybe practically pulling people together from different walks of life uh, across society, that you were saying this could, that ordeals could function that way actually within the family as well. Say if you require fathers to bring their kids to get vaccinated or for checkups or require them to attend a certain number of prenatal visits or something. Possible, yeah. So I think that really a lot depends on the particular design. If you design it in a kind of gender-blind way, it can make the division of labor worse because if it's possible for costs to be taken by women, I suppose on average they will, uh, but it can also make things better. Also, if you, if you design them without paying any attention to how they can contribute to setting back women's opportunities, they can contribute to more, to more division in society. So. Um, if there's some kind of resentment from women who have a shot at the kind of high-flying jobs that require a lot of their time, they may actually strongly prefer pay sharing for this reason and, and resent the ordeals. Whereas if you allow enough flexibility for people to express what they value most, for instance, allow them to pay perhaps a lot into the system instead of dealing with ordeals, this can be conductive to more kind of social solidarity although not in the way that, that Dan was suggesting earlier. Yeah. Uh, uh, this really, uh, in lots of ways, duplicates what, uh, what Christopher said, but uh, if we envision a society that's totally egalitarian, people all have the same resources, and they've all had similar health conditions, so none of them is advantaged or disadvantaged, and people are just paying for their own insurance uh, or for their own health care out of pocket, there's no insurance or whatever, then the market is really going to, uh, you know, those people who really need uh, the, the platinum uh, service or who, for whom comfort's enormously important, they're the ones who are going to purchase it. And, you know, it'll all be hunky-dory. But uh, since we're not in a situation like that, uh, if we're relying on other kinds of resources of uh, being willing to withstand certain kinds of ordeals, we can elicit what an ideal market uh, would, uh, uh, would elicit and one would hope with proper design have something more egalitarian than uh, relying on a market in the real world with all the inequalities that there are in terms of what, what it would produce. I'm a little, I, I want to go back to my question, though, about sort of epistemic uh, status with regard to, say, health needs. Because that, it feels to me as if there there's a divergence from how we think about the market in that when, when we're talking about lack of knowledge within the market, what we're usually talking, I don't know, usually, one way in which that applies is that we're thinking, well, no centralized figure has knowledge, right? Knowledge is distributed among participants in the market. And so hence, we end up getting efficient uh, and effective um, distribution through markets because individuals know what they want to need and they are the ones making the decisions. But from your presentations, uh, especially from yours, Christopher, right? your point was, but also I think, with yours with the bronze versus platinum, the point is w the individual agents actually don't know necessarily what they need. And so that's where I thought ordeals played a, an interestingly different role from how, the, uh, how we think of the market as functioning, precisely because it's neither the centralized uh, figure nor the individual participants themselves who have sort of epistemic standing. I'm, I'm glad you're pressing on that point because I, I think that makes can you talk into the microphone? Uh, I'm glad you're pressing that point uh, because I think that uh, draws out something about healthcare, which is uh, peculiar. I mean, healthcare is sometimes referred to as a credence good um, uh, because the consumer is not able to evaluate typically what healthcare she needs. And so it's a challenge for any sort of consumer driven approach, whether ideal ordeals or cost exposure. 
um, for the patient to be able to self-diagnose um, whether she should consume or what which care she should consume. Um, so uh, I think that is a, a peculiarly difficult challenge for healthcare. It's it's uh, there are other sectors of you know the uh, uh, capitalism or the or or I guess the economy more generally that that have that feature. But I think healthcare is probably the paradigmatic example. Uh, education also uh, these asymmetries of information are something that economists were rather slow in uh, coming to recognize, but it's certainly a major uh, uh, aspect of contemporary economics. Yeah. Um, I had a question uh, to Anka about her intriguing uh, suggestion of the, towards the end uh, to somehow involve, involve the men in the, uh, in the, or in the burden um, for various reasons. Um, uh, I, I'm intrigued by this. I, I have some some reservations, and I will, I'm going to suggest the direction that this might that might address some of them. So, one issue is that antenatal care is oftentimes not like those brand name drugs that we want to discourage people. It's it's actually the the sort of thing that we want basically to increase access to, make more convenient, etc. Uh, so for the remainder, you might tie in the men, but it's basically our task is to try to make it um, less burdensome. Trying to think about the nearest example might be, so WHO recommends, unless there were updates, uh, Peter or others, uh, telling, uh, three antenatal visits, and afterwards the strict health benefits go down by a lot. We had significantly more than three, um, and uh, maybe we should be discouraged from that because it's waste our money and the system's money, etc. Um, so maybe in that context, one could introduce such uh, requirements. The other reservation is, I think to require things, especially on such an intimate matter, is going to be, it's never going to pass. Um, what I was thinking is that, um, and, and it's also in a way self-defeating for the um, system to admit that some of the burden is falling on third parties. Because in a pure deal, it would fall, it would fall on the patient herself. With the case of babies, it's it's complicated. Uh, but say if it's you know an ordeal, you know requiring men to come with their aging parents rather than uh, women to come with their aging parents is admitting that the burden uh, is not on the patient, but also that there are negative externalities for their family, which is basically. Not, not a good thing in the first place. It's one of the problems in the distribution of uh, the burdens of ordeals. It's totally unfair that people who are not the main decision makers should be burdened. So here is a way maybe to try to address, address that, um, make them less explicit. Uh, so some tasks, some tasks in the, the common division of labor in the family are somehow gendered for men. So the men are the ones who take the, you know, take the garbage um, uh, to the uh, garbage bin. Maybe we could somehow try to focus on those ordeals that are already gendered for men in that way and try to boost those, work with those. Maybe we could try to create a culture in which yeah, if you're manly, you will be the one who, I don't know what, fills that for. That's a very manly form to fill or something of that sort rather than kind of work on the uh, kind of explicit coercion that admits that the system, in fact, is allocating the burden to the wrong person. Okay, let me start with the last uh, point. I don't think anybody is having in mind explicit coercion. It's about defaults. Uh, and it's, it's about designing for defaults by defaults. And it may be easy or a bit less easy to opt out of defaults, but uh, this is what defaults are. You can opt out of them if you want to. And I think with respect to some policy design, it has been shown that there is quite an impact of having of, set, of how you set the defaults. So when it comes to uh, people willing to... to donate organs, it makes a difference whether the default is that you are not a donor or whether the default that you are a donor. It doesn't mean that it's terribly coercive. You can fill out the form and opt out of it. Um, then I suppose with respect to children's need for care, whether it's prenatal or, or after birth, um, it's a particularly easy case because it's, it's clear that children need somebody, a, a third person, to take the burdens of taking them to doctors, right? That's not something um, that's particularly difficult to acknowledge. 
and it's not something that is possible to, to be taken care of. Well, I suppose we could design health systems in which children are being picked up by special people who take them to doctors rather than expect their family members to do this. But unless and until we do that, it's clear that for a child to see a doctor or to be hospitalized, they need the help of a family member. And yes, it may be somehow disturbing that we put um, uh, costs on a third person in order to deliver health care to children, but uh, I think this has always been the, the default. The question is whether you also want to tinker with the default in terms of who's supposed to do this, you know, to make it explicit that, that uh, uh, fathers have to do it at least a certain proportion of the time. And with respect to prenatal care, yes, I think uh, so one, of the, one of the reasons I started by saying that I'm not somebody doing medical ethics in general is to say that I can't necessarily think of precise examples of, uh, of uh, medical treatments in which it makes sense to use ordeals. But I suppose that there are medical treatments for perhaps some groups of pregnant women or perhaps related to some, some kinds of giving uh, birth to children which are efficient to use only if people are, have a certain level of commitment. So, I don't know, making certain exercises in order to have an easier child birth only makes sense if you are committed to, uh, to be an active user of, of that particular method or whatever. So, I, I suppose there can be cases in which there are reasons of efficiency to use ordeals in order to ration uh, these kinds of treatments. And if and when they are, they can be a, an occasion to, to use designs creatively to require men to participate more. Again, in a way that's easier or harder to opt out of. Peter, and then I'll invite others to come up. So listening to this conversation, I, I am just sort of uh, struck by how uh, we cannot really have a very uh, specific discussion if we don't make more explicit what our positions are on certain things. And I think this is inherent in discussions about distributive justice. So the first thing that I think is good and interesting is that at least all three presentations are grounded in a very straightforward empirical question. What actually happens to whom when you do something, right? Um, and uh, and that's, that means we're in a world now where we're talking about the empirical Impl implications of different kinds of ordeals on uh, people uh, when, when you implement them. That's nice, we need to do a lot of work on that because that's essential information to decide how to do ordeals, whether to, how to do ordeals. The question of whether to do ordeals is how we value those impacts. And here I find the discussion all over the place. So um, uh, people are using words like efficiency. What do we mean by efficiency? Economists mean a utilitarian view of efficiency. Public health people mean a health impact view of efficiency, right? Those two things are often not the same at all, right? So we need to be clear, what do we mean by this? And this conversation about individuals and, and the term families, or what I would call households, is also very confusing. Why should we value the individual impact of an ordeal relative to that on a, on a corporate unit in which most of the world inhabits, that is the household, right? And I can think of many examples where uh, the point was raised that um, putting fees on health care uh, would impact better off uh, individuals more than poor individuals. Not necessarily true. In poor households in countries where I work, putting fees on things mean women don't get care because the men control the household budget. You know, so it's a characteristic of the household. So all of these things just basically boil down to all these conditionalities. Which, and all, I guess my main point is, if we're going to be in an empirical world evaluating the impact of ordeals, we really need to be very explicit. What are, we, what are the metrics of valuation that we're using? And then what's the ethical foundation of those? Personally, I don't think there's a single answer to this question. It's just important that we're discussing the same thing. Just assume you hear other questions. Okay. Other questions. Oops. So I is this on? Yeah. So I I found it very interesting, but something I hadn't thought about before, but in, in Dan's presentation. So I, I expected this session to be primarily on 
distribute the distributive effects of using ordeals in terms of you know we think about the burdens and the benefits and then I don't know if this is exactly what Dan had in mind but what what I started realizing as he presented is that there's also a different kind of distributive effect of ordeals namely as we go through them they have some and I, I started thinking in terms of you know I associated to I'm Swedish and I'm too young to have experienced it myself, but my father, for example, grew up in a country which had mandatory military service, which a lot of people disliked, the majority of the population disliked it, but it had this positive externality in that people from so different social classes got to meet each other, they all complained about the same ordeal <laughs> that they were forced to go through, and so on. And, I, and, and, then, and I think it's sort of the same thing can be observed in Richard's paradigm example yesterday, that he invoked, you know, all Americans have the same experience of going to the physician's office, and we all have to sit there, wait, and waste our time for one, two hours. And that's an experience Richard shares also with very poor Americans, I imagine. And that's some kind of equalizing effect that we maybe not should... Um, Ignore. Yeah, uh, uh, I think that's right. Although, as I said, I'm sort of very cautious. I mean, it's certainly very different uh, being uh, in the military for a number of months or or years with other people. Uh, you know, seeing them day in and day out, as opposed to. Um, being stuck in the same office, sitting there for uh, uh, a half an hour, so the effect that effect I think is is uh, fairly minimal, uh, and this is in part in response to Peter. Uh, underlying the way I was thinking about this were real uh, egalitarian uh, commitments, not egalitarian in the sense of thinking about equal distribution of wealth in society, but in terms of the relationships among individuals and the extent to which uh, being privileged with respect to wealth translates into privilege in all sorts of other regards in, uh, in society and the ex whether uh, ordeals could, to a small extent, uh, mitigate that, from my perspective, extremely um, uh, unpleasant and uh, really uh, ethically repugnant feature of our society. I, I'm curious in that respect, actually. So it felt like you and Anka had very, that in, the two of you were both motivated in some ways by ideals of solidarity, where it's the solidarity may have had egalitarian commitments, but you, had it seemed like opposite uh, conclusions near the end where you I think do not want to let people buy their way out of ordeals precisely because it is the participation in the ordeal that potentially builds the sense of solidarity and whereas Anka you seemed actually open to people buying their way out of the ordeal um, which then potentially seems to undermine solidarity I'm, I'm curious if I'm right or wrong about that I, I really saw myself as um, giving some possible considerations to be taken into account in what I think will have to be on every case in the, with the respect to every ordeal, a, a sort of um, a judgment where lots of things, are, are lots of pros and cons. So no, I wasn't defending. I'm, I'm not generally happy that we live in societies where you, money can buy you all sorts of things. Um, on the other hand, we do allow money to buy us all sorts of things, and then I think a special case has to be made as to why we don't allow, we don't want to allow money to buy you out of ordeals. Uh, so, as a matter of consistency, I think it's a very general kind of um, of problem we're facing. Another uh, question I'm having with respect to, to this idea is whether whether not allowing people to buy themselves out of ordeals is really going to help, help with solidarity to the extent to which people from different walks of life are not actually using the same medical practices. So are they really going to spend any time together, in the, together with people from other uh, social environments in the same waiting room or not? Um, plus lots of other considerations, all of them empirical about the likelihood of resentment and 
I don't know. Unfortunately, this is one of those circumstances where I think one wants to say it all depends. Uh, there's so many different contexts, and in certain contexts, not allowing people to uh, buy their way out of uh, waiting can have you know, terrible, inegalitarian, indirect effects. And so uh, I, I think one really needs to look in very detailed ways at how these things are working out. Audience members have questions. Feel free to come up to the mic. Oh, sorry, Chris, did you want to jump in? I mean, I just think it'll be very challenging to to have such a system in practice that that really holds people in. I mean, in, in the U.S. society, we have such a geographic gradient, for example, that the people showing up at the DMV um, are actually already pre-sorted by geogra geography, such that it's a fairly narrow band. I mean, first of all, the people that own cars. Um, but even within the people that own cars, it's the people that live in Watertown, Cambridge, um, where housing is, is a given price. And, and, and so thinking about trying to use our health care system for this instrumental goal of promoting social solidarity, um, <laughs> like you say, it all depends. And I, and I'm, I guess I'm skeptical of, 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 of you doing that very usefully. Maybe we should have compulsory military service if that's our goal and have people build bridges together. I, uh, it, it, you know, there's a category mismatch here by trying to use our healthcare system to serve that goal. Other systems like education or military or public works or churches or voting booths are, seem like prima facie much more suited to that goal. Yeah, just very quickly, although I, I mentioned that, that wasn't my, my main concern. My main concern was uh, uh, avoiding the uh, inequalities that we wind up uh, creating in order to deal with uh, moral hazard problems. Thank you very much for the interesting presentation. I had two questions with regards to audios serving as equalizers. Um, and my question is whether you have thought about um, cases in which there's some self-selection that happens within the people that are in that particular group. Um, and, and that is with regards to the point about solidarity. And I was thinking about that in, in a, a context that is different from the United States, where, for example, if you have people queuing in a line, uh, those people can then determine among themselves who's supposed to go to the front of the line. And, and what are ways in which you can deal with those cases? Um, for example, in some cultures, it might be possible that the elderly, are, by virtue of being old, are just supposed to be given preference whether their need for health care supersedes one of a younger person or not. And so in that case, does that order serve its purpose or, or is it defeated by other factors that are operating? in that scenario. And, and the second question uh, goes to you. With the point about enabling people to opt out, doesn't that then defeat the entire purpose of the ordeal then? Or because I, I would make the point that if there's an option for people to opt out by um, uh, paying somebody, for example, to stand in line for them, then doesn't that uh, promote the inequalities that we were trying to deal with to begin with. Um, for example, if someone has someone who has the ability to pay somebody to stand in line for them is obviously going to benefit more compared to somebody who doesn't have the money to pay uh, somebody to stand in line for them. Did you? Um, yeah, well, again, we are talking about very non-ideal circumstances of societies that are already very unjustly unequal. Um, and then, yes, I think there is a case against letting people pay others to do various things for them, for instance, cleaning their houses. But there's also an egalitarian case for allowing people to pay others, especially if, if this is regulated and especially if, if you have to pay quite a bit of money for others to do things for you, like stand in line and, and pay your house and, uh, or clean your house. So I don't know whether the, 
And I don't know whether it's a, it's a worthwhile kind of trade-off. I don't know whether in the end you end up with a more equal society because the money is distributed a bit more equally, um, or whether you end up with a less equal society because the relationships between people are in some ways more unequal. Um, I, find, I find it personally distasteful, the idea that, that we can pay ourselves out of all sorts of ordeals, be they in relation to healthcare provision or cleaning our houses. But um, I think there is a discussion to be had about this. And, and just very quickly, I, th I think you made a really uh, excellent point that uh, in designing ordeals, we're, we really need to take into account all sorts of uh, social norms. And uh, it may well be that if we don't take those into account, uh, that the sorting that the ordeal is going to involve will be very different than uh, uh, what we'd intended. No, it's a great point, though. Hi, good morning, everyone. Um, so Chan Lalto, I am a teacher, a professor, actually, but I teach public health in the Caribbean in a small island, Trinidad and Tobago, and um, I'm teaching international health this semester. So um, we are confronted with an actual real challenging problem. We follow a sort of a universal healthcare model. Of course, being a small island state, its resources are rather scarce. We are right next to a very large comparatively country that is under serious economic turmoil. And what happens is that we are now having a refugee crisis and an asylum crisis. Inevitably, um, what is going on is that there are thousands of people coming over. I know that we are signatory to some of the international conventions, and by law, we are supposed to actually provide health care. My challenge is and my concern is, and I do discuss this in class as best as I can, um, any advice with respect to legal advice from Christopher and maybe someone else from the team as to what are our legal obligations and how do we actually um, facilitate our obligations without actually compromising or creating an unsustainable health care? I know it's a very think, tough question. I did raise it when I took my students to the UN local office, but I didn't really like the answer I got. So, I'm sorry. Well, it's, it's a great question. It, it, it sounds like you're asking about the legal obligations under international law. Yeah. That's an area I don't know, I know. much about. I'm sorry. I mean, if uh, we could have a bit of a conversation about, in the U.S., you know, equal yeah, protection I, and disability law and things like that, but, but I'm just not an expert in international law. Okay, but, but at least um, from anyone from around, um, with respect to how do we ensure that we provide healthcare. Just let me illustrate a model, something that happened actually. Um, we have, I think, one oncology center in the entire country. And um, there was a, a young man that came over, um, and he actually had, I'm not sure what type of cancer he had specifically, but we could not provide the healthcare because our own local kids are not actually receiving healthcare because of resource constraint. He actually, unfortunately, um, passed on, and we were you know, made to be so bad, but is a toss up, how do you deal with your tax paying population and so on, and still at the same time ensuring that you know, people get health care? So is there any advice? I, mean, I know the gentleman here talked about working in developing countries. So I just want to say, I actually think your question is not really about the legal obligations. Mm -hmm because the legal obligations are probably very straightforward, straightforward yeah. right? Your question is what to do about the legal, yeah. what to do in the, yeah, in yeah, the case of the legal obligations, all, yeah. right? And um, actually, I'm going to talk a little bit about this later because I think that um, this question of where obligations confront uh, adequacy of resources imposes ordeals in a sense. So uh, I think that's the question you're asking, how to cope with that problem. Mm. I don't have an answer for oh, you. But just okay, to... well, okay, thanks for, for clarifying my question. Just want to clarify the question. <laughs> I was, maybe later on when there's, I think there's a modeling um, part of the last discussion, or second to last discussion. Yeah. Right, so maybe then. Okay, thank you. Okay, thanks. Um, I, Great. So that certainly teed up a whole bunch of uh, um, important uh, questions, but um, that much broader around distributive justice, even than just ordeals. Uh, but I do want to thank our three panelists in our workshop. For it.